Welcome to the B&H event space. My name is Mike Mejewell II, and uh, I'm going to talk to you guys today a little bit about what I do, some of the images I've captured, and in particular, uh, my landscape photography work, uh, some of the things that have come from it, and the funny stories behind the images, the vision, the technical aspects, uh, some stories about failure. And this, uh, this talk is meant to inspire you guys, but also to you know, show the people out there that, you know, I hear it all the time, they say, hey, I want your job, you can just go out and take pretty pictures. Uh, it's not like that all the time. Uh, a, lot of the, a lot of failure goes into it, a lot of hiking and uh, planning and a lot of uh, actually stress and anxiety sometimes goes into these shoots. But if I walk away with one image from that outing, it is a heck of a day. Uh, that is lava coming out of the Kilauea volcano. And I like to open with this shot because it's kind of funny because, like I said, people think, oh, hey, you just walk up, take a pretty picture. Well, this was one of the first snapshots I took after a 13-mile hike out to the Kilauea volcano. And what happened here is two things. Well, actually, three things. One, I ended up with an amazing shot. But see that hair on my legs? That was gone after the shoot. Uh, the lava, which was 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit, actually singed some of the leg hairs off. And also, the shoes, the soles of my shoes were no longer there at the end of the shoot. So it's pretty crazy. Uh, you know, the title of this series that I'm talking about is calling Getting Connected with Nature. Uh, this is Getting Connected with Nature. Get yourself out there. When you guys go out to shoot in nature, put yourself in positions uh, where the normal photographer wouldn't put, put yourself. Keep it safe, but to get some of these angles and get some of these shots, you guys want to really uh, think outside the box. So uh, this is up in Banff National Park up in Canada. One of my workshop students snapped this of me just out in the, uh, the river there. It was freezing cold. Yes, my pants are rolled up. No, I'm not wearing shoes. But the shot that came from it was a really unique shot. Uh, and it took getting out there and putting myself into nature, not just standing off on the sidelines. Iceland, anybody been? All right. Uh, just another scene, another work workshop uh, participant shot of me uh, getting out there. And what I did is kind of Hulk smashed through this, bro this frozen uh, tide pool, put on waders and got a really nice shot of this piece of ice that almost mimicked the mountain behind. That wouldn't have been possible just sitting on the side of the lake there. So I encourage you guys as we go through this uh, talk today to be inspired to go above and beyond what it takes to create an image. First things first, we're gonna talk about <clears throat> uh, one of my favorite places to shoot. It's up in the mountains, it's nice and cold, it's not easy. Uh, anybody been to Banff? Awesome, so it's like a photographer's Narnia up there. Everywhere you turn your camera, it's something beautiful. But one of the things that I like to talk about is when you're out there shooting, you are learning the P word. Does anybody wanna guess what the P word is? Patience. All right, patience. It's not photography, patience. This shot right here happened when it was negative five degrees Fahrenheit outside and it took hiking through about four feet of fresh snow to get to this one spot right here where these rocks that were covered in the fresh overnight snow kind of lined up as leading lines pointing to where I thought the sunrise was gonna come up. When I set up for this shot, we had completely gray skies and it looked like there was absolutely no hope of a sunrise. As the sun started to rise, still had nothing, completely gray. We had about a three minute window when the sun peeked out of the clouds and the whole sky lit up like this. The, the lake was a perfect glassy reflection and the snow with it being fresh powder overnight just had that very pristine, soft, fluffy look to it. So everything came together for this one moment. Three minutes later, it, we were back to gray skies and that was it. So, Patience pays off when you guys go out here. And you know, I, I encourage you guys to go out there with the mindset that you want to capture a great image, but go out there as well with the mindset that you want to be there. You want to take in the mountains. You want to take in the snow. Even though negative five Fahrenheit doesn't sound too warm and, and you'd rather be inside in a blanket, take it in. Um, you're in a place that most people would absolutely love to be. And if you can enjoy that, then when your patience pays off, it makes it so much more worth it. For the technical side of this shot, if anybody's curious, this was shot with a Nikon D810 and a Nikon 14 to, 4, uh, 14 to 24 millimeter lens, so very wide lens. 
and you'll hear me say for each image my technical settings and they're not going to change too much. Uh, I try to keep things simple and I keep my go-to lenses uh, to pretty much three lenses. Also, uh, for this shot, I used a polarizing filter, which really, if you're familiar with a circular polarizing filter, it helps cut down any glare uh, in the water so you don't get any nasty, harsh reflections or uh, spots that glare. And also a 0.6 soft grad. So if you're not familiar with what a soft grad is, that's essentially a piece of glass or plastic that goes in front of your lens as a filter and it's got a darker area at the top that transitions to a clearer area at the bottom, and it helps you balance out exposure. So if you have a very bright region, uh, like your sky here, and a darker foreground, you can put that filter in front to help kind of neutralize your exposure overall and create a balanced exposure like this. Some people ask me if I bracket or if I do HDR photography. I think because of my film background, I stay away from all that. So I try to get things as right as possible in the camera and that's by using filters and such. Another thing, when you guys go out there, pay attention uh, to what it is you're shooting. You know, this is in Vesterhorn, or this is in Iceland, it's Vesterhorn Mountain. It's a beautiful mountain. Uh, it's absolutely <clears throat> one of the most stunning places that you can go in Iceland. And a lot of people will just go out there and just split their frame 50-50 with this mountain and try to get the tide pull reflecting the mountain perfectly. But they tend to often overlook the small details. And you're gonna hear me refer back to that a couple times during this talk. So this shot right here, uh, it had black sand underneath the, the tidal pool there, which is only about an inch of water. But there was also <clears throat> some areas of that water that were frozen. And it was not frozen to where I could walk on it frozen, but frozen to where if I touched it with my fingers so gently, it would break. So it had very fine details to it. So I noticed that and I found some areas, especially in the bottom left and the bottom right hand of the frame here, that almost looked like fingers the way the ice had frozen over, and it kind of gives you this beautiful leading line look. And using a polarizing filter, I was able to cut out any reflection in that one particular area there and see through the water to reveal those details. I also used another soft grad to kind of help balance out the exposure here, and a 14 to 24 millimeter lens for this shot as well. So it's so easy when you guys go out there to shoot uh, in these wonderful places to think wide, um, and think just, hey, right here. But also take the time to you know, move a foot right, move a foot left, tilt your camera up, tilt it down, get lower, get higher, because you'll be amazed at some of the details you could pick up and how they'll help uh, influence your image. I love ice. This first set of series is on ice and cold places. Same mountain. Anybody want to guess how far away I was from this shot for this shot? Anyone? So this shot was about 15 feet away. The ice had formed completely different right to the left of this shot. And it, when I noticed it, this area right here, these cracks or negative space, the black area there, that's only about two inches wide. So by getting real low with a wide angle lens, those cracks or areas where the ice hadn't completely frozen over created these beautiful leading lines that help pull your eye through the whole frame and right up to Vesterhorn Mountain. So it's things like that that most people will walk right on by if they're not taking in the scene around them. If you, if you become, and we all do it, we all become very focused on just, hey, I need to go here. But you can really see quite a few uh, shots if you look around and really take in every little inch that you walk on. Uh, I would have walked right past that if I didn't look down. I would have never seen that shot, and I would have probably gone and shot something very similar to what I just shot previously. Another instance here. Uh, this is Abraham Lake up in uh, Alberta, Canada. And these are frozen methane bubbles. And they're uh, quite fun to find. It's like a big Easter egg hunt when you're out there looking for them. But it's these little details. These bubbles are only maybe an inch, inch and a half wide. But when you get down low with the wide angle lens again, just like that previous shot, those bubbles become really dominant in your frame and they give you a whole sense, uh, a whole different sense to your image. And to get this shot, 
what I had to do is use, a once again, a grad filter. You'll hear that phrase a lot to help balance out the sky. But I also did a technique uh, called focus stacking. And if you're, not, if you're not familiar with what focus stacking is, essentially, what I had to do is keep my camera on the tripod and nothing moved except for my focus point. And I focused on the very closest point that I could in the shot. And I did it probably six or seven times all the way through the frame to the furthest point. And the reason I did that is because even at a high aperture, say f22, my shot when I'm that close to my foreground is not going to be completely sharp from the foreground all the way out to that furthest mountain. So by utilizing focus stacking, I can take those shots at different focal points and distances and then take them into Photoshop and with two clicks of a button, have those uh, layered together for one super tack sharp shot all the way through. Uh, it's a technique that if you go out to do landscape photography, uh, I encourage you guys to learn because it can really separate your image uh, from another one that doesn't have that sharpness all the way through. Also, be on, the, be on the lookout for things that you feel no one else would shoot. Like this shot right here. Does anybody want to guess how high up I was for this shot? Six inches. Six inches? Okay. <laughs> Who thinks it's a low, a low angle shot? Uh, who thinks it's shot from a helicopter? No? A lot of people actually ask me if I shot this from a helicopter. And the answer is no. This is shot from about three inches, the minimum distance on my tripod that I could get off of the ice. This crack is maybe about a half inch, three quarters of an inch wide. And I did that technique that we just talked about, focus stacking. So everything from the very closest bubble all the way out to that mountain are nice and sharp. If I shot this at f22, which is a really good depth of field, or deep depth of field, I would only get maybe about half of this frame nice and sharp before I started to lose my, uh, my sharpness throughout the frame. So focus stacking, when you're getting really close shots like this, is a huge uh, benefit to, to have in your, in your technique. And also, once again, 14 to 24 millimeter on a Nikon D810 with a 0.9 soft grad. So a little bit brighter area at the top, so I had to go with a more dense uh, soft grad to kind of help balance out my frame. Once again, details. And in, in landscape photography, it's all about trying to separate yourself from a, somebody else's shot. Uh, so one of the techniques that I like to, to do as well is use a 10-stop or 6-stop filter, which if you're not familiar with those, what those are, it's essentially it looks like a sheet of black glass that when you hold it up, <clears throat> it's so dense, cuts out so many stops of light that you can't see through it. Well, what that does is that allows you to shoot longer exposures during uh, brighter times of the day. So this was at sunrise, a little bit after sunrise actually, the sun had already risen behind, uh, that's a, uh, Rundleson, or Mount Rundle in uh, Banff. But I was able to put on this 10-stop uh, filter, and I was able to get, I think it was a 30-second long exposure. And that's why you see all the streaking in the clouds here. 10-stop uh, filter with a 0.9 soft grad on top of it. And that really helped me balance out my exposure, but get that long, drawn-out shot as well. And this is an area that I've never seen anything like this before. The frozen ovals in the ice was just incredible to see. And these were about a foot wide or so. Never seen them anywhere else. I uh, have no idea how they formed, but as soon as I saw them, I knew that was going to be my shot because the way that they just kind of repeated all the way out to my background really helped the image out and gave it a really good dynamic. So, um, you know, you, you heard me say it earlier, keep your eyes out for small details like that. Uh, you know, frozen lakes. I've shown you guys a few images here. You can have bubbles, you can have cracks, you can have weird patterns in them. They're really fun to, uh, to go out and shoot. But if you're going to do it, be safe about it. Uh, this is also up in Canada, and this is a shot, I won't go into the full story. If you'd like to hear it after, I'll tell you it. But this is a shot that almost killed me. Um, long story short, I went out <clears throat> on the ice and uh, I got so focused on looking for these methane bubbles and 
I forgot to really watch where I was walking. And so I went from an area that was safe to walk on to an area that was too thin to walk on and had to have a, another photographer who's on the ice pretty much rescue me off this ice that had shattered and uh, get me back to shore. So if you're gonna go on the ice, uh, make sure it's at least four inches thick. Uh, it's not frozen within the past few days and uh, you've got somebody else out there to kind of make sure that you are uh, gonna come home alive. Uh, but this shot, even though the story behind it was uh, a little sketchy, still one of my favorite shots that I've gotten. Uh, found these bubbles out there. Uh, they had a beautiful, uh, <clears throat> just glassy look to the ice. There was no snow on it whatsoever, so it looked like a mirror. Uh, and uh, nice sunrise light. So I used uh, the mountain in the background as well to kind of go for more of a symmetric view here and the bubbles in the foreground to kind of lead you up there. So anytime you have, you have lines or repeating patterns, you can use those as your foreground to kind of help lead somebody's eye throughout the frame. The thing with leading lines is you always want to remember you want them to lead you into the frame, never out of the frame. Also, challenging situations. Okay, this is uh, Lake Louise in Alberta again. It was a blizzard when I took this shot. We're talking several inches per hour blizzard. And I wanted this shot, but I couldn't get it because the snow that was coming down was obscuring the trees so densely that they looked kind of just foggy. So instead of saying, okay, you know what, I'm gonna come back another day and try it again, which I think this was my last day out there, I threw on that 10 stop filter that we talked about earlier. That 10 stop filter allowed me to do a two minute long exposure for the shot. And that two minute long exposure, as you can see with the water here, created a very frosty look to the water. It has a nice glossy look to it. But it was also blurring out all the snow that was falling and letting in the light in which I needed to see the trees. So this shot <clears throat> was only possible by doing a long exposure because if I did say a fifth of a second or something quick like that, all you'd see is snowflakes falling down. By, <clears throat> by blurring the snow essentially like I did the water, it, was, it allowed me to see through all that. So that's a technique that I always try to remind people of when you're shooting in heavy snow or even heavy rain, sometimes long exposures like that can help you reveal your subject without the distraction of the snow or rain. Also, <clears throat> when you go out and shoot uh, winter scenes, don't forget to throw on your telephoto lens. Okay, your wide angle lens is pretty much your go-to when you're out there shooting landscape, but your telephoto, say a 70 to 200 or 200 to 500, can help create some really cool compression shots and some really cool scenes. No pun intended with the cool. Um, this shot was up in Iceland. I had pretty much blah skies the entire scene besides this one spot here where the snow was getting blown down the mountain. And these are all, it looks like one, but these are probably in this shot about I would say 14, 15 different icebergs all lined up. And by using a long lens, I was able to compress them all together to create this giant stack of ice. And I zoomed in so much with my lens that the snow in the background really filled in nicely and I didn't have any negative space there uh, like I did anywhere else in the scene. So don't be afraid to throw on your, your telephoto lenses as well for landscape photography because some of those scenes can be uh, really nice with that lens. If I had stuck with my 14 or my 24 here, uh, this scene would have never happened. So don't be afraid to use the big lenses. I know they're heavy. I know some people are afraid to, to use them, but they could be your friend out there. Also, uh, going back to extreme conditions, it takes work to create these photos. It's not just, you know, you show up and you get out and, and everything's set, and so, or set perfectly for you. Uh, this is Death Valley. If anybody's been out to Death Valley before, this is the Mesquite Sand Dunes. And they're a very popular area to go shoot. And because of their popularity, they're also a very hard area to shoot because you deal with nonstop footprints. You think you find the perfect sand dune and then you look through your camera and you see just a trail, looks like a trail of ants almost on the top of the ridge. And you realize, okay, well, <clears throat> those are footprints. You don't necessarily want those in your shot. So I knew I wanted to go out there and I wanted to get a nice shot of the dunes, but 
I didn't want to deal with the footprints. Well, I knew that evening there was going to be some wind. So I was like, all right, well, maybe if I go out there, uh, nobody else is going to be out there because of the wind, which was true. I went out there, and there was nobody else out there. So I figured, hey, the wind will start you know, you know, remolding these dunes into their pristine shapes. Well, little did I know, the winds are about 50 to 60 mile an hour winds. So I stood out there with all my camera gear and <clears throat> got the best exfoliation I've ever had of my skin. And it was extremely hard to shoot. Uh, I, I was honestly terrified to be out there shooting because the amount of sand that was getting whipped up, I was like, this is it, my camera's toast. Like there, there's no coming back from this. Um, so I shot knowing, hey, this might be the last life of my camera. And when I, when I shot, I wanted to capture the motion of the sand, which was actually really hard when uh, you're trying to do, you know, a third of a second or even, you know, a half a second to a second long exposure uh, in winds that heavy using filters. Your filters sometimes become like sails when you're using square, square filters. So it was extremely challenging. So for this shot, what I had to do is line up my shot get my focus on manual focus, because autofocus was not seeing through the amount of sand that was being blown in the air. Put my back right in front of the camera and essentially become a human lens hood and shield it as much as I could. And I rattled off probably, I would say, 30 different frames at different speeds. And <clears throat> this is a one second long exposure that I was able to get, and it was sharp and nice, and it captured the motion of that sand really nicely. But uh, it was extremely challenging to get. And uh, the cool thing about it, though, was when I got back to the hotel room that night, I had absolutely no sand in my camera. So uh, I used Nikon, so props to Nikon for that. And the, the weather ceiling handled that quite nicely. Um, but I went out there, if you guys remember the beginning of the story, I went out there for those pristine dunes. And we've talked about patience. Well, going through the uh, crazy winds paid off because this is what I was left with at twilight. Perfect dunes everywhere I looked, no footprints whatsoever, and also the storm had moved off to the east, and if you look off in the distance, especially on the left side of the frame here, you can see that fog. That's all the sand being blown away off to the east, so it created this really eerie look, and the twilight light just created this beautiful kind of warm, cool tones contrast, and this is what I came to get out there, and it paid off uh, by going through all that to get this one shot. And uh, you know, sometimes you, sometimes you you don't luck out, and it doesn't always work out this way. But you know, if you're going to go for a shot, go for it because you never know how it could pay off in the end. Let's get to some hot stuff here. Uh, this is one of my favorite stories to tell. There's a lot of work that went into this image that ended up going completely viral on the internet, um, resulting in some hate mail, some fun mail, some uh, licensing to uh, National Geographic and papers all over the world. So I went out two years ago, I uh, saw that the Kilauea volcano was going off. And for the first time in three years, there was actual lava flows going into the ocean. So. I've always been obsessed with tornadoes, and tornadoes we'll get into in a minute, and they've been my first thing that I've always loved. But volcanoes have been my second thing. So I knew I wanted to go out there, and I wanted to capture lava. I wanted to capture going into the ocean, and, and I wanted an image that you know, showed the power of the, of the lava, and also where people could literally say, I feel warm, I feel hot, I feel like I'm standing on the volcano through that image. So my goal was to go out to the cliffs and to use a long lens to shoot the lava going into the ocean. So I hiked all the way out there. I uh, had a 500 millimeter lens on me. Got all the way out to the lava, was super excited, put on the lens and realized this is absolutely nothing what I want. Like this is horrible, like it's, it's beautiful to see the lava going into the ocean, but I want more. So I set out for a couple days worth of, of different hikes to find an image that really, you know, was what I wanted with the lava. And so I first went out onto a boat, chartered a boat, went out there, 
uh, to get the lava from a closer range in a much more kind of eye level range. I thought this would be cool. Maybe I could get that image where you really felt like you were connected with the volcano. And this is one of my favorite shots. Uh, it's a 24 to 70 millimeter shot. Just shooting, no, no filters here. Just shooting the lava flowing into the ocean. And it's nice, uh, I was happy with it, but the thing for me was, you don't, you don't know exactly what's going on. You see the lava going there, but you have no idea for scale. You have no idea what exactly is going on besides lava. So to give you an idea, that flow on the left there was probably about 15 to 20 feet high. And you have absolutely no sense of how big it is here by looking through this image. You could say, okay, maybe that's a couple feet going into the ocean. So I decided, all right, what I really need to do is scout out where the lava is on the surface. Forget about the lava flowing into the ocean. I need to get closer. So after talking to a few different friends of mine who shoot lava uh, pretty much daily out there, I got up the courage, rented a bike, biked three miles on this gravel road, then hiked, I think it was another five miles or something like that, out to the area where the lava was. And I was able to get closer. This is, sorry, this is one of the shots from the boat still. Um, I was able to get closer to the lava, okay? And when I turned the corner, I'll never forget, <clears throat> when I first saw it, I was on cloud nine. I was like, this is it, this is everything I wanted. Now I just need to wait for that beautiful sunset so I could get the lava with the sun glowing behind it. So I set up my shot, and the thing with lava is you have to obviously be careful, but uh, that's 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit right there, so this isn't necessarily the most comfortable area to be standing in. I was about three, four feet away from this shot, uh, from the lava in this shot, and I could only stand there for a matter of seconds before I literally had to move because it was getting too hot and too dangerous. So I'd set up my shot, take it, move, set up and take it, move, and this is one of my favorite images from that night that I got. But when, when sunset came, there was no sunset. It was completely clear skies, so I was happy that I found the lava and happy that I was able to get some nice detail shots of it, but I wanted more still. I, I was looking for that shot that would really separate this image from any other lava shot that had been taken before. So I looked up and I said, well, hey, you know what? <clears throat> clear skies are great for night photography, so why don't I try and do <clears throat> some shots of lava with the stars. Sounds simple enough. So I waited, waited, started playing around with some you know, shots of me in with the lava as twilight faded. And uh, when I, after I took this shot right here, I looked up and I said, hey, you know what? It's a crescent moon. I should be able to see the Milky Way. The Milky Way is far enough away from the moon to where I might be able to properly expose this where the moon doesn't blow out my shot and I can use the data in my raw file to pull up the Milky Way a little bit. Now a quick thing before I show you this next shot which is the shot, a lot of people told me hey you can't create this shot because in one image this is a composite, it's fake, it's photoshopped because you can't balance out the moon, the stars, the Milky Way and the lava. The lava is too bright. Well, a lot of this lava that you're seeing here is actually subsurface. It's about six to 12 inches below the surface in cooling. So it's actually a lot dimmer than what you see. So the long exposure really absorbed quite a bit of that light, so it really pops the lava, okay? So I set up a vertical shot, said, all right, I'm gonna get the moon, try to get the Milky Way, we'll see what happens and get the lava. This is the shot I walked away with. Lava, the moon, Milky Way, and if you look really close on the top left, that's a meteor going through the shot as well. And then the unicorn tail just off frame. Um, so four different elements all in one shot. If you want afterwards, I will be more than happy to show you the raw image uh, on my phone. All I did after I created this shot uh, was adjust my white balance because my white balance was off a bit. I did a small crop and then I did a little bit of dodging and burning to help bring out the Milky Way and reduce the highlights on the moon. And that's it. This is pretty much straight out of the camera right here minus those things. Now, 
And the reason I told you at the beginning I got a lot of hate mails, people, this went viral, and people literally sent me messages saying from all over, this is fake, how dare you, you're doing this, yada, 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 you're running the photography industry. This is real, I promise you. And like I said, I've actually put out articles on Petapixel and I think F-Stoppers as well, showing the raw image. And then people emailed me and said, oh, you know what, you photoshopped this raw image with this raw data combined, oh, so you can't win. But this really did happen. Now this took three attempts to get this image. Okay, the first attempt when I shot it, it's a 14 to 24 millimeter lens. So it's a very wide angle lens, a lot of room for error. First time I shot it, I had a huge, on the left hand side of the frame, just out of the frame, area of lava that was actually above the surface. So that was putting off a really bright uh, flare that came into the lens. So the first shot I took, <clears throat> you could see the night sky, just how it is, but you had a huge, really obnoxious flare coming in from the left side of the frame. So I was like, all right, well, I need a lens hood. The Nikon 14 to 24 doesn't have a lens hood. It has a built-in lens hood, but it's not big at all. So I decided, all right, if I hold my hand a couple feet off to the left, I can be a lens hood and I can block that flare. So I took the next shot and it helped a little bit, but there's a lot of lava over there. So that, my hand was not enough to, to shield that flare. So then I said, all right, well, I'll put it on a timer put on a 10 second timer and then I stood off to the left hand side of the frame and I tried to put make myself as big as possible to be I, I, uh, a lens hood. When the shot clicked, I went over there, <clears throat> looked at it, zoomed in. I didn't look at the rest of the shot. I just looked to see if that flare was coming across the image. No flare. And then I looked up and I saw the meteor coming across and I was like, that's it. I'm not gonna be able to top this. Pack it up, let's go home. So this is the image that really uh, made that whole trip out to Hawaii worthwhile, and it wasn't even planned. I had set out there for that original shot of lava flowing into the ocean, and then I wouldn't settle for anything less than spectacular, and this is what happened. So settings-wise, real quick, this is 2500 ISO, f2.8, 25 seconds. So, <clears throat> like I said, the Lava, most of this was, uh, was, was cooling and was in the cracks. So with it being that uh, minimal amount of light to the naked eye, I was able to balance the exposure using a long exposure that way. And uh, the lava showed up nice and bright and the Milky Way was able to be exposed. Now, if that moon was any more than say a quarter to maybe even a third moon, and if it was any closer to the Milky Way, I don't think this shot would have happened because it would have started to really wash out the stars closer to the, to the center of the Milky Way. So a lot of elements came together that night to uh, make an image happen. And uh, you know, patience pays off, hard work pays off, but sometimes you really do have to have a little bit of luck on your side as well. The eclipse, anybody see the eclipse? Was it spectacular? It was one of the coolest things I ever saw in my life. Also, one of the most frustrating things. When you go out to shoot, <clears throat> be prepared. Be prepared not only for everything to go perfectly, but for everything to go completely wrong. I went up uh, to Oregon to teach a workshop up there. Uh, when I first got there, long story short, my car was given away, my rental car. So with everybody being up there for the eclipse, there were no rental cars in the entire state of Oregon or Washington. I flew into Portland, had to be south down to Brookings for the next day to meet up with my workshop participants and to teach them for the week, and then I was gonna go out and shoot the Eclipse by myself. I ended up renting a U-Haul truck because there were only three left in the state of Oregon, and I drove a U-Haul truck around to teach my workshop, and when it came time to shoot the Eclipse, I drove it up this really sketchy mountain to the top parked it, slept there overnight for a few hours, and then the next morning set up my shot. My goal was to do a uh, composite of the, the clips going across and transitioning, uh, but I was kind of broken because I, I, I didn't know if I wanted to actually do all that effort or just enjoy it. Like, I, I was torn. So I decided to shoot the first few images, and then I was like, you know what, I really want, this is a once in a lifetime event, I want to take it in. So I decided I'll just shoot it when it starts getting to be prime time. 
Okay, so my plan was to have the 500 millimeter lens, zoom in, gra grab the moment that you start getting the beads and the flare and the corona and all that. Well, <clears throat> this is shot as I broke my lens, purposefully. Okay, so what happened is I had a solar filter on the front of my lens and as a screw-on lens or filter. It got cross-threaded. So as I'm getting ready two minutes before totality happens, I can't get this, this filter off my lens. I'm looking around and there's all the other people just taking it in now. I'm probably freaking out and stressed. So I've just bought this lens, never had the chance to really use it besides this, this moment. Grab the front element, Hulk style, rip the whole front element off of the lens. Broke my lens right there, and I'm literally looking at the front element of my, of my lens, holding it in my hand going, oh my gosh, what did I just do? All right, forget about it, you got a few seconds. Put it down, shot this shot, and this is actually one of my favorite shots that I took of the Eclipse. Uh, it's not totality, it's not the moment where you get the, the, di the diamond ring effect. Uh, it's, I love it because you could see the moon dipping into the sun and you could see, you know, you start to get a little bit of that kind of corona effect on the right hand side. And because I messed up my lens, I got this really crazy flare that happened on the left hand side of the frame, which I think actually kind of adds a nice touch to the image, gives it something different. But when totality happened, I was able to get this image here as well. Um, one of the coolest things I've ever seen, if you ever get the chance to go shoot totality for new clubs, please do it. Um, this shot was, I believe, at a third of a second uh, F18 and 200 ISO. And I had it on a tripod <clears throat> because at 500 millimeters, you want to keep it as still as possible. And uh, got the shot. It's kind of that diamond ring, of, ring effect. As soon as the, uh, the sun kind of flares behind the moon, you get this. And it only lasts for a matter of seconds. So it was really cool to, to see in person. And I, I'm not going to lie to you guys. When I shot this, I was not looking through my viewfinder. I had my cable release, and I was just doing this and hoping that everything was in focus because at that point, I really wanted to see it with my naked eye. Um, nature. Nature's cool from the ground. It is even cooler from the air. So if you have the chance to ever get up in a helicopter or a small plane and you can bring your camera with you, it reveals a whole new side of these beautiful places. This is the area very close to where I shot that image with the bubbles in the mountain. So you can see a completely different perspective. This is out of a helicopter. It was negative 40 Fahrenheit when I took this shot. So I looked like a giant marshmallow. I had probably about 10 layers on. And I'm not, I'm, no joke, I couldn't press the button on my camera, so I was literally doing this, like just trying to jab at it to, to click my shutter because I had so many layers on. Um, but. Getting up in the air gives you a whole new perspective. You see things completely different. You see patterns, you see shapes, you see light in all different manners. And one of the coolest things that I got to do in the past year was go and do an aerial shoot over Iceland. Okay, so this is up towards the highlands of Iceland. From the ground, these rivers just look like water. From the air, you see all these different colors and mixtures, the way that the silt is mixing with the glacial water gives you these crazy colors. This is in Photoshop. These colors are not, didn't slide my saturation to 100 or my vibrance to 100. This is the natural color. Different areas of Iceland, the water mixes different ways and creates these incredible colors. Um, also, if you've been to Iceland, you're familiar with their black sand that they have there. So this is a channel that was cut out on one of their black sand beaches and had water coming from a glacier down into it and then mixing into the ocean. And all these crazy colors, they just contrasted so beautifully with the black sand that I couldn't get enough. So next week, I went up again. But I went up again that next week with the mission. I said, okay, you know what? This is cool. I love the details. I love the textures. But it needed something. It needs scale. It needs a human element. So I traveled out to a different area of, of the river system. Different colors. This isn't, like I said, this isn't Photoshop. These are the natural colors of the area there. But <clears throat> I brought along some friends. So I asked a couple of my workshop participants uh, after our workshop, said, hey, you know what? Do you guys want to go for a flight? They said, yeah. So they hopped in, 
they had a second plane. And I decided, all right, how cool would it be to get a shot of this plane flying over the river system? And the plane was this beautiful cherry red plane, <clears throat> popped just gorgeous. So we tried, and we tried, and we tried, and we tried, and tried. And I don't know if you've never been in an airplane trying to line up another airplane coming perfectly at you at over 100 miles an hour at different altitudes. It's hard. But we got it. And this is the shot that happened. So this shot was 24 to 70, had about three seconds before the plane entered the top left part of my frame and exited the bottom right. It happened twice. The first time it happened, the pilot, our angle was slightly off, so they were actually over in the snow a bit, and the white on the wings mixed it in with the white of the snow. So as excited as I was to get it the first time, I said, oh man, all right, I know this isn't it. So we had to do it over and over and over and over again. And finally, we were able to get this shot where he was perfectly lined in the center of the frame in an area of kind of negative space there. And everything worked. The contrast of the red, the white, it all popped beautifully with the brown and the blue. And uh, it took a lot of work. And it, uh, if you want afterwards, I'll show you the flight path. It looks like a bunch of donuts. Uh, I mean, it took us about 30 minutes and a lot, a lot of spinning to get that shot. But um, the shot, the, the specs on the shot were 1 800th of a second at 5.6, and I think I was at 400 ISO. Um, I wanted that fast shutter because he was in and out real quickly. So I wanted to make sure that when I got him, he was nice and sharp. And uh, obviously, the f5.6, um, I, I wanted as much detail below. Um, so you'd think, okay, I need a deep, uh, <clears throat> deep, uh, or a big aperture for that, and a lot of uh, a lot of depth. You don't. When he's that far from you, and you have that much space between him and the ground, you can use a shallow or a smaller uh, aperture, and you're not going to get that that softness between. You're not going to get that that uh, shallow depth of field. Night sky. I know you guys want to go out and shoot during the day but also go out during the night. It's pretty cool. 80% um, of the world never gets to see the Milky Way because of light pollution. So if you get the chance, go. Take your camera and go. Uh, it's always funny when people who live in the city say, oh, man, there's so many stars out at night, and there's like five. I'm like, we need to get you away from the lights and, and introduce you to the Milky Way. Um, so I photographed the Milky Way for quite a while now, probably about, I think I started getting into it in like 2008. Um, <clears throat> It's great, but when you go out and you shoot the night sky, try to tell a story with it. Try to have a subject with it as well. Don't just go out there and say, oh, you know, here's a silhouetted shot of the ground with the stars above. Try to find something to tie in with the Milky Way. So for this shot, <clears throat> I wanted an old church in there. And uh, I had to get access to the shot, this uh, spot because I live in Texas, and if you go on private property in Texas, you're not going to leave that property. Um, <laughs> it took a long time to really get this shot uh, to happen. It took about three months, actually, of me contacting the property owners, bugging them over and over. And then finally I told them, hey, I'll make a donation to the church as well and then give you a free print if you let me go. So they said, all right, <clears throat> you got to make a donation. You have one hour. So I did my planning. And if you, uh, if you need to plan for the Milky Way, a couple things to plan for is, one, the moon phase. You want as, a little bit of moon, if possible. Uh, it helps light up your foreground. Uh, to no moon. You don't want full moon or like even a half moon. That's a lot of light. Uh, but you also want to check your weather forecast. Obviously, if you have clouds, you're not going to have the stars. And then you want to check and see where the Milky Way rises and sets. So in the northern hemisphere here, typically early April <clears throat> to, say, September, maybe early October, you could have the Milky Way. After that, it's dropped below the horizon to the southern hemisphere. When I say the Milky Way, I'm talking about <clears throat> this part right here, the juicy part, the, the celestial center. That is the center of our galaxy, and that's what shows up best in photography. So I planned out where the Milky Way was going to be, when the moon phase was going to work, hopefully when the weather uh, was going to cooperate. And I told him, OK, I will take my hour on this night. So I drove two and a half hours away from home, got in on their property, started shooting. And I was so excited that I would finally gained access to their property and so rushed at the same time 
then when I got home that night to, uh, to put the images up on my uh, hard drive, I realized that I had shot everything out of focus, slightly out of focus. I thought it was in focus, but it was out of focus. So I called them up, not gonna lie, I had a little bit of man tears going, and I said, hey, I screwed up, can I please come back? And they let me back the next night and we had a little bit more clouds, but I actually like the shot with the clouds versus the shot without the clouds because it gives you a nice texture and, and some depth and detail in the sky. So when you go out to shoot Milky Way, don't be afraid of having some clouds in the sky. Uh, it can really add to your shot and, <clears throat> and give you something else that, you know, the, the empty night sky is great, you see all the stars, but those clouds can sometimes help quite a bit. Uh, also, another church that I shot out in uh, West Texas, um, like I said, I like to have some sort of foreground or something to tell a story with the shot and not just make it about the Milky Way. I use the Milky Way kind of as a supporting role and then I bring in some sort of foreground. Uh, Milky Way shots, you guys want a higher ISO, so anywhere between 2500 to say 6400. Uh, that's a good way to kind of start off as a higher ISO, a low aperture, so 2.8. F4 works, but if you can get a 2.8 or a 3.5, that really helps quite a bit with the light. And then it's personal preference. Some photographers prefer shorter exposure times because they get less of the star trails going. Uh, me personally, I shoot mostly 20 to 30 seconds. That kind of <clears throat> gives you the stars uh, with a little bit of motion, but not enough to where it looks soft and fuzzy. Anything longer than that, I feel like you start to lose the Milky Way and it starts to look a little soft. Once again, stories, clouds. Uh, this shot here is from uh, Big Bend, down way down in South Texas. It's an old abandoned bus. Threw some uh, LEDs inside to light it up and did a little bit of soft light painting on the outside to bring some life to the truck as well. Same thing right down the road. Uh, once again, you know, I often tell uh, my workshop participants, hey, why, why are we here? Why did we drive five hours to this one spot? And they go, oh, to shoot the Milky Way. Did we? Why, why didn't we go three hours down the road to that empty field and shoot the Milky Way there? It's about your foreground. So see if you can find some interesting foreground to put with your night sky and then use your night sky, like I said, as a supporting role. Uh, the Aurora. One of my favorite things to shoot. It is absolutely spectacular. Has anybody seen it? Pretty, pretty amazing. So it is so cool that I encourage you guys, the first time that you see it, to not take pictures for the first 10 minutes. Enjoy it, okay? Then quickly grab your camera and set it up. The Aurora is the uh, best way to explain it. it it's, it's a surprise because five minutes before I took this shot, there was nothing in the sky, black skies. Then the sky ripped open, had this here for about three minutes or so, and then everything went dark again. So the Aurora, you have to really, really be patient with, and you have to just be dedicated, because even if you go to an area where your higher latitude is, say Norway or Iceland, this was shot in Banff, you're not guaranteed to see it. So be patient with it. Try over and over again going out whenever you have clear skies. It's kind of like the uh, Milky Way. You don't want a full moon or a lot of moon when you're out to shoot the Aurora because unless it's a really spectacular display, it's going to wash it out. So make sure you kind of plan that time accordingly if you're going to take a trip somewhere where you can see the northern lights. But um, <clears throat> they are fantastic and so much fun to shoot. And once again, like, like I said, the Milky Way, you want it as a supporting role. So try to find some sort of foreground to use with the Aurora. Um, it is possible, if you're quick enough and you have a strong enough display, to do a panorama. This is a eight image pano of the Aurora in Iceland. This was the very first time I had actually ever seen it. And I knew that, hey, you know, this one shot of, of the mountain here, it's great, but if I could capture this whole scene, almost 180 degrees, showing what's going on, that's something. So I was able to get my ISO down to, I think it was 1250, and my aperture was 28. My shutter was one second. That's how bright the Aurora was that night. So I was able to get my tripod set up nice and level, 
one second click, one second click, one second click, and I quickly moved as fast as I could across the horizon from left to right. And it took me a couple times to get it, um, but I was able to get a sequence of images that all lined up perfectly when I stitched them together and thus far created this image. So first step to shooting the Aurora, take it in for a few minutes. Second step, get a nice wide shot, but then if you have a really spectacular and bright display, go ahead and try and get a pano. Um, this is blown up, hanging up in my living room, and uh, one of my favorite shots that I've gotten. So is this. This is a 12 image panorama from Banff. It is the craziest Aurora display I have ever seen in my life. And this was a night <clears throat> where, once again, patience paid off. This was 1.30 in the morning, and about a half hour prior to this, I had packed up my camera bag and started walking back to the car, thinking that I wasn't gonna get anything. Then I had this gut feeling, you know that feeling deep down inside where you're like, you're gonna regret this. So I turned around and said, all right, I'll give it a little bit longer. Went back, and the sky ripped open. To, to this display for about 15 minutes where it was purples and greens and whites and blues. And uh, I was able, once again, this is 640 ISO F3.5 at one second. So for those of you that know night sky photography, a 640 ISO at night for one second is insane. And to be able to pick up all that much light. So this was incredible. And this is after I took this shot, I only did one pano of it because I wanted to watch it. I said, I don't care if I miss it, miss the shot. This is the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life. Um, so the Aurora, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a gamble. You can go out there and you can sit out all night and get nothing, but sometimes you get those amazing displays. And even though this lasted about 15 minutes, it was worth being completely sleep deprived. And the next day I had to drive from Banff, starting my journey home down to Texas. Completely exhausted, but it was so worthwhile. Same thing here. Uh, this is that same mountain you guys saw earlier, Vesterhorn from Iceland. Uh, the one I was showing you guys, the details in the ice and the reflection. Uh, this is my last trip out there. Uh, I was just got my uh, new Nikon D850, and I was really excited to use it to shoot some auroras. Well, I was teaching out there, and during the time I was out there, I didn't really have too many opportunities to shoot the auroras. Well, go figure, two days after I was scheduled to fly home, there was supposed to be a big solar storm. So I uh, delayed my ticket, rented a, uh, a van, and hoped for the best. I went up two hours north of the airport, and I said, okay, this is gonna happen, gonna nail it, gonna get that awesome aurora shot, and I dealt with 70 mile an hour winds and rain all night. Sat there, tucked my tail. The next day, I said, okay, I looked at the forecast again. The only clear spot in the entire country of Iceland was eight hours on the opposite side. So I filled up with gas, drove eight hours across to the other side of Iceland, ended up here at Vesterhorn, and was able to get this shot here. This is another eight image pano, 14 millimeters. Uh, this was, I believe, three seconds at 2.8 and 800 ISO. Um, the Aurora was moving, but it wasn't the craziest of shows. So it was still, if you've seen the Aurora, you can tell sometimes it, it's really, really fast and really violent, shaking. Sometimes it's just kind of chilling there. This was more of the kind of hanging in the sky shot, so I was able to do a little bit longer exposures. Um, this one's a little bit more of a pain to get to stitch together, and I had to manually stitch some parts. But in the end, it ended up to being a huge, huge uh, image uh, with lots of detail and a beautiful night sky in it. Landscapes are cool. Sometimes take a moment to see what else is going around, because uh, sometimes you may be uh, being watched and you don't know it. Uh, I was shooting a reflection up in Canada and had my uh, 24 to 70 on there. I think I was just shooting some of these trees reflecting in a river. And uh, I kind of looked over and I realized I was being watched. <laughs> so very quickly, I threw on my 70 to 200 and got a couple frames of this elk right there just staring at me and I was staring at him. And it's one of my favorite shots I've ever taken. Uh, it's just 
to have that connection and to just be completely alone and you know you're you're watching him he's watching you uh it's such a cool moment and uh i love the symmetry of the shot as well i usually don't like to put my subjects directly in the center of my frame but sometimes it works here and i felt that it was kind of balanced out and necessary in this shot uh with the way that his his uh antlers were and just the way he was perfectly looking at me uh, so please take a look around. Don't don't just get focused in on one thing because sometimes you may miss those moments uh, that you'll never see. Same thing. Look for the details. This is out in uh, Colorado. I went out there to shoot fall colors, I'm driving through uh, Telluride, and uh, I was driving on the highway. Saw out of the corner of my eye one tree, and I was like, oh hey, you know maybe we're gonna start getting into fall colors. And then I thought, wait, hey, hold on, that was cool. So I drove all the way back. <clears throat> Actually, I couldn't turn around for a couple miles, so I had to drive all the way down, then all the way back, and threw on my zoom lens and got this shot. And once again, don't like to put things in the center of my frame, frame of time, so I felt like in this scene it worked. Just that, uh, that one aspen standing out and that yellow just popping uh, worked out really nicely. So once again, take a look at your surroundings, and don't. it's so easy to get focused on the big scene, look at the small details at times. The lava? Same thing. Most people th would think, okay, lava, <clears throat> you want to shoot it wide. This is with a 200 millimeter lens, zooming in on probably a two foot by two foot area where the lava was cooling and you had these crazy bands and ribbons and the glow coming out through, through the lava there. And uh, I almost didn't bring my 70 to 200 with me on that trip because I didn't want to hike with it. Glad I did because this shot right here was, uh, was one of my favorites that I, that I captured there. So pay attention to the details and sometimes keep it really, really simple. This is up in, uh, this is the, actually the morning of the eclipse. Uh, this is Mount Jefferson up in Oregon. And we had some smoke that had settled in to the valley from some, for, uh, some uh, forest fires. And we had some smoke in the air that was kind of lofted up at the, uh, in the upper levels of the atmosphere. So it created this narrow band of just glow. And I was sitting there and I was going, man, I really wish I had like a 500, 600 millimeter lens to zoom way out on the mountain there. And then I ended up putting on, I think it was the 24 to 70 or 70 to 200 um, and shooting this vert vertically keeping the symmetry in the shot and keeping it very simple. And uh, you know, these aren't what you want to go out and shoot all the time, but sometimes when you have a scene like this, you know, it's worth uh, keeping things simple. All right, let's talk about some of my favorite topics, storms. So tornadoes, severe storms, they have been my fascination ever since I was a little kid. Um, they're also, you know, one of those things you obviously have to be very careful with with shooting, but the images you get can be quite rewarding. Um, tornadoes, for me, are not the end goal when I go out to document severe weather. Mother Nature creates these amazing clouds, and some of them are just absolutely breathtaking that you look at the tornado when it does happen, you're like, oh, that's cute. I'm gonna go back to shooting this part of the storm. So this shot here, is from Oklahoma. It is one of my favorite storm shots because it just shows you how crazy you can be out there uh, chasing storms and photographing storms. One minute you've got completely clear, you know, picnic weather. You're out there and you think it's a great day, and then moments later you have this incredible supercell thunderstorm move in and bring, you know, baseball, softball size hail uh, into into your day. Um, when I'm out there shooting storms, though, I also like to shoot. Uh, not just you know particular areas, but the whole storm in general. So these storms, each one's so different, and that's what's intriguing to me and keeps me going back shooting storms because I can photograph this storm, and I know the moment that it dissipates, no one will ever get to photograph that storm again, or no one will ever see that moment again. So each storm is so unique. Um, some of them are incredibly sculpted, like this storm, where you could see all the ingredients in the atmosphere coming together and just completely twisting the storm and turning it to where it spins like a top. And these storms can last for hours. They bring tornadoes, they bring crazy hail, they bring winds that are over 100 miles an hour. And uh, yet, they can be so peaceful and beautiful from a distance. This shot here, uh, another image that I like to show because when you're out there shooting tornadoes and photographing them, you have sometimes seconds to get your shot. Mm -hmm. On the left-hand side of the frame here, 
and you see a tornado forming. That's all dust that's being kicked up underneath what's called a wall cloud. Um, on the right hand side, you see a really, really bad day, and that's all softball sized hail coming our way. So I hopped out, took this shot, and about 30 seconds later, we almost had our windshield blo uh, blown out by the hail, and we couldn't see a dang thing. But I wanted this shot, and I like to shoot these scenes because it's such a contrast. It shows you um, that moment <clears throat> in time like when the storm is just coming at you and you know it's just so many different dynamics going on here and like i said it's just a scene that i know for instance that day nobody else was on that road with me nobody else was crazy enough to be in that spot and i got a shot that really tells the story of that storm that will never be seen from anybody else now i'm not suggesting you guys all go out grab your cameras and start heading to oklahoma this may don't do that please don't do that but weather can be really fascinating and addicting to shoot and like I said, it's not all about this, the crazy severe weather, the tornadoes. This is out in Arizona. Uh, this is a real shot. I didn't just chop off the rest of that storm there. It's a, I believe this is a six image panorama that I shot and I couldn't believe what I was seeing. The way the light was coming over, uh, there's a, uh, a mountain behind us. Uh, it was cutting off the rainbow from forming all the way through, and, and there was still rain blowing off to the right-hand side of the storm, but it just looked like, it almost looked like a double exposure to me. You now you could see the storm on the left-hand side of the frame, and then it was like complete peace on the right-hand side. If I shot this with just one image, it would have been really hard to show this whole scene. So when I'm out shooting weather, I try to shoot uh, panos as well, especially in scenes like this where uh, you know, a single image probably wouldn't do it justice. Once again, uh, this is a super cell thunderstorm. And I saw this, it was an absolutely beautiful storm, had a great sculpture to it, <clears throat> it was really twisted. You could actually see the motion in the storm in the shot. Um, and this was out in Leote, Kansas, so far southwest Kansas. Try to find foreground in the middle of Kansas, it's pretty hard. Um, there's nothing out there. So I was kind of freaking out because I really wanted this shot, but I didn't want to just get it with a field. So I saw off in the distance an area where the field that I was next to went from brown to green. So I was hoping <clears throat> that there would be something there, maybe a windmill or something or a fence. There was nothing but this road. And I am not the biggest fan of shooting down a road for road shots, but sometimes that's all you have. So pulled over and did what, what, what any wise photographer would do in the middle of a thunderstorm. I stood on top of my car. And when I stood on top of my car, it gave me that depth that I needed looking down the road. It almost gave you that leading, vanishing line. From the ground, you didn't see that. All you saw was dark ground on your left and some wheat or, or green on your right, and you didn't have this look to it. So hopping on top of the car was not the most exciting thing for me to do, but I did it and got the shot. And it, I feel that that uh, composition really made this image work rather than just shooting it over a field of nothing. Um, this was a 24 to 70, no, sorry, this is a 14 to 24 millimeter shot, 100 ISO, F8, and I think it was about a 200th of a second or so. Uh, no filters uh, on this. Uh, usually when I'm storm chasing or photographing storms, I don't have time to put filters on and mess with that, so most of that's uh, no filter. <laughs> Once again, panorama. Uh, <clears throat> this is why I love storm chasing. This storm never produced a tornado. It may look completely scary. It didn't even produce hail. Like it produced small hail, but nothing to even worry about. But it had this incredible structure too. It looked like something off the movie Independence Day. And uh, once again, shooting this uh, 14 millimeters, uh, it would have been a nice shot, but doing a panorama really shows the storm, all, all of it working and functioning. Not to nerd out too much, but if you look on the right-hand side right here, <clears throat> that's the storm's what's called an inflow band. So that area of the storm is pulling in moisture and really helping ramp up the storm. And then you can see this area here that looks like a bunch of kind of like stacked pancakes. That's your mesocyclone forming. So that's another part of the storm that's completely churning. And then below you have what's uh, called kind of like a wall cloud uh, that's trying to form. That's where it's trying to rotate even tighter to get the tornado to form. All right here, there's no rain falling. All your rain is falling off to the right-hand side there. So everything from a, um, 
uh, kind of nerdy weather side of, of this is beautifully displayed in this image here. Um, and it wouldn't have been possible to capture all that in just one shot. So uh, a really cool moment out there and another instance when shooting a panorama uh, works out quite nicely. Another one right here. Uh, one of the scary moments I've had shooting. Uh, this was out in <clears throat> West Texas. I was once again kind of on the roof of my car and I wanted to get this line here that you guys see in the middle. Whoops. Uh, you have this kind of like, it's almost like a kind of canal and then a dirt road. <clears throat> and I had nothing else to work with. That barn on the left hand, that shed on the left hand side was kind of in the wrong place to use as foreground. So I hopped on top of the car, shot this, and as I shot this shot in this pano, the tornado sirens went off. Okay, this was just a regular severe worn thunderstorm, not, no uh, tornado warning on it, but the sirens went off. And then this area right back here for a brief moment after this, there was a tornado revealed. So I realized this is at 14 millimeters and it's a pano. I was way too close. So I grabbed the shot, got in the car, hauled east and was able to get to safety, but not one of my uh, safer moments shooting, but happy with the way the shot turned out. Another moment, <clears throat> like I said, don't really like the road shots. If you guys ever see a road shot for me, you know that Mike was absolutely out of the foreground and there was nothing there to shoot. But the shot leads you into a very violent area of this storm. And this is actually the same storm, if we go back, as this one. Just only maybe 10 minutes later. And what had happened, the sun had set, but it had still sun, kind of like a sun uh, set glow behind the storm. And I guess there must have been a hole in the clouds to where that light came through and was able to illuminate all that area nice and orange and pink. And you could see the storm still rotating and uh, just a really eerie scene. And uh, one of my favorite storm shots that I've shot here. And in this shot, I did have time to actually grab a grad filter to help balance out the exposure because that's a tar road, so it was really black. You had a lot of darkness underneath the clouds, so I was able to put the grad kind of almost diagonal like this across to help balance out the whole scene there. There are tornadoes when I go, uh, go out chasing. Um, I'm very particular on the images that I post when it comes to tornadoes um, because I do keep in mind that although I'm out there photographing something that is amazing and at times beautiful, it is doing uh, damage and it could possibly be killing people and um, you know I don't like to put those shots out there where it's going through a town and I'm bragging about the shot that I got when it's really showing this crazy destruction and somebody's life is being changed. Um, I did put this shot out there because what I like about it is the sense of scale. And when you're shooting tornadoes, you don't really have the um, availability to go, well, you know what, I'm gonna put the tornado here and I'm gonna get this as foreground and I'm gonna focus stack and I'm, you know what, I'm gonna try this. You have sometimes seconds to shoot your shot. So I shot this just to originally show the uh, scale with the telephone wires. But then after I shot it, I noticed this crazy guy right here. If you look real close, that is a guy in a tow truck. And I kind of wish I was where he was because his view must have been amazing. But it also shows once again the scale of this tornado. So there's your tow truck right here. So figure that tow truck maybe, call it 15 feet tall, something like that. Now you get a whole idea of how big this tornado is. And to show you as well how fast tornadoes change and how you have to be extremely careful when you're photographing them, this tornado, about five minutes later, was a mile wide. So when I chase and I photograph tornadoes, I like to keep my distance. I like to use my zoom lenses rather than you know 14 millimeters uh, because you have to be extremely cautious out there on what you're doing because you're not in control and those tornadoes can change so quickly. Another tornado, once again, trying to keep my distance. Uh, beautiful tornado uh, two years ago out in Kansas. Uh, <clears throat> once again, no foreground. So I tried to use the telephone poles and also the trees way off in the distance to kind of give you an idea of scale. 
and also shooting a panel with this tornado. This tornado that you see right here is the same tornado as that one, just minutes later. So shot this shot here, and this is a, I believe it's a six image panorama, 14 millimeters, no filters. Uh, I noticed when I shot it, the crepuscular rays coming in on the left hand side of the frame, so I wanted to keep those in uh, the shot, and the only way to do that was by doing a panorama. So if you're not familiar with doing panoramas, best way to do them, vertically. So shoot vertically, give yourself about a third to a half of the frame to overlap to give enough data for Lightroom or Photoshop to stitch together. And uh, always give yourself a bookend as well. So shoot more than you think you need to in case you need to crop or uh, work on that image size. You have extra space at the ends. Uh, something that I've tried to do over the years is also incorporate a sense of the human element with my storm photography. This is one, the first time I did it, and uh, I was shooting the storm, <clears throat> believe it or not, as scary as this looks, this storm is nothing to be worried about. Uh, this is up in Wyoming, and uh, I had my buddy Barrett with me, and he's from Louisiana, never really seen storms. So I told him, hey Barrett, you want a you wanna photo of you with the storm? Yeah, sure. So I said, hey, put on this blue jacket and go stand out in the field. So I sent him out in the field, and so I'm shooting just from outside the door, I'm trying to get him really tiny to where um, you have that sense of scale again. It's just not working. His head was kind of coming over the horizon there and, and didn't have that feel that I wanted. So once again, Mike ends up on top of his car. And I realized when I got on top of my car, that separation with the height put him lower than the horizon. And then he looked really tiny with this storm. So I rattled off a couple shots at 14 millimeters jumped down, I was actually really excited with how the shot looked, hopped back in the car and I was reviewing a few of them. And for about five minutes I reviewed them and I forgot he was still standing out in the field. So he came back. Uh, the following year, this is actually one of the finalists uh, for the Environmental Photographer of the Year contest. Didn't win, but it ended up getting put into a museum in Paris for about five months, which is pretty cool to see. Um, but once again, trying to tie in the human element uh, with storms to, to kind of give a new, uh, new feel to my storm photography. There's a shot that, uh, I have way more shots like this on my website, and I'll have that up at the end that I encourage you guys to go check out. It's one of my favorite shots, it's called Beauty and the Beast. Um, but that shot was taken two years ago and went completely viral and actually ended up with a, uh, with a story on Inside Edition about us going out and creating this image. So, um, I encourage you guys to all check that out at the end. Lightning, uh, people often ask me what I'm most scared of when I'm photographing storms. These suckers. So, does anybody want to guess how wide lightning is? Everybody looks really scared to answer. <laughs> so lightning is an inch wide. And it is 10 times hotter than the surface of the sun. And they can strike up to 80 miles away from the storms. So that's why I'm terrified. Um, but it is one of the most fascinating things to capture because like the storms themselves, they are never the same. And they take a lot of persistence, a lot of patience, and a lot of luck to photograph. For instance, this shot right here, this is not a composite. This is not a 30 second long exposure. This is about an eight second long exposure where I set up, got my focus, did a test shot, just a test shot, just to see how it looked. All four of these struck down at the same time and that was it from the storm. Nothing else. So to get that shot right there and to be that lucky, uh, you know, the photography gods were watching over me that day. Um, there, were, uh, there was another storm that popped up to the north of this where we had a little bit more lightning, but nothing like this. And uh, you know, like I said earlier, sometimes luck has to be on your side uh, when you're shooting these things. Daytime lightning, people often ask me, how do you shoot that? Well, let's start off with nighttime lightning. First off, nighttime lightning, say like a 400 to 800 ISO, F8, F5.6, somewhere around there, and then cable release. Put your camera on bulb and hold and hope that the lightning happens. You need to be careful though, because if you don't get the cloud to ground lightning bolts like we're seeing here, sometimes you have lightning that's inside the clouds that will wash out your frame. So you need to, to stop and check your frame and see maybe it's 15 seconds too long, 20 seconds too long. And you're hoping for the big bolts, the close bolts. That's what you want, not the little distant ones. They don't really do much. 
and they're really hard to actually capture when you're shooting at those settings. So you're looking for the big, powerful, close strikes. Daytime is much harder. Uh, there are two ways to capture lightning in the daytime. One is by using a lightning trigger, which uh, it, it's, it's a great tool, but requires the right kind of lightning. It needs lightning that's called staccato lightning, so it needs to see the initial bolt and then the next bolt that follows after it. And so what happens is it sees that first bolt, opens your shutter in hopes of catching that next bolt coming down. And uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. The technique I like is uh, the abusing digital photography technique. And that means you have a card where you can shoot a thousand images, you get your settings, you sit there and you just click and you hold. And if it doesn't happen, you go back and just erase and start over. Um, I've caught more lightning strikes during the daytime that way than I have with a trigger, to be completely honest with you guys. It's, uh, it's a lot of work, but if it fails, the other thing that you've got is a really cool time lapse. So uh, lightning in the, in the day is really hard. You want to expose just for your scene and then just click away if you're not using a lightning trigger and hoping that you get something. Uh, another technique you can try is using like a three or six stop neutral density filter to kind of cut out some of that ambient light and then set your aperture extremely high, your ISO extremely low. So what you're doing is you're cutting out as much light as possible, which will allow you sometimes to get a two or three second long exposure. Um, but for that, the problem is you need those big, bright cloud to ground lightning bolts because if you get some of the, the weaker ones, they're not gonna be bright enough to overcome the low, settings that you, low light settings that you have. Uh, <clears throat> please be careful if you do go out and shoot lightning. Um, this is a shot that took a lot of luck and a lot of attempts. And I wanted to get a shot with the lightning extremely close from a safe distance, but not get struck. So I went underneath these power lines <clears throat> and I said, all right, you know what? Maybe I'll get lucky. Maybe I'll have a bolt strike nearby. Well, what happened is I set my back seats down, set my tripod up, and I wanted to originally shoot through like an open window, because sometimes with the storms that we get, you can have no rain, but you can have lightning. Well, it was raining, so that wasn't gonna happen. So what I did is I focused on the, the, t uh, the wires, the power wires, and I let the, the raindrops on the window kind of do their thing. At first, I was kind of reaching through the front window, trying to wipe it off, that wasn't happening. So I just said, you know what, I'll just deal with it, and whatever happens, happens. I got this strike, and what I love about it is everything is perfect because there's so much going on. If you look at it, you've got the leading lines of the power lines leading you to the bolt. And if you look closely on the water drops, you could see the lightning bolt refracting in some of the drops. And the really cool thing is if you look right here, down where that strike is happening, that strike's not touching the ground. It's actually striking the power lines that I focused on. So it was so cool to see this and to capture this moment. Really, really lucky once again. Um, but one of my favorite lightning strikes that I've got, and I think looking back, if I had shot this with the window down and didn't have the water drops on the image, I don't think I would have liked it as much. The water drops really add a whole new dynamic to it and really help it feel like a thunderstorm. I think you get really, really, really lucky. Um, <clears throat> I had a workshop out West Texas to shoot the Milky Way. And as a instructor, your worst fear when you do a one night workshop that's based upon seeing the night sky is to have rain. That's what we had. We all met out there at seven o'clock at night. It rained and it rained and it rained. So I'm going, oh my gosh, how in the world am I going to you know, recover from this? Uh, I've got 10 participants right now who hate me and are very tired. So I said, you know what, hey, let's go out. There's another storm coming through. I'll teach you guys how to shoot lightning. So we went out and we went to this tree that I kind of refer to as the Lion King tree. It looks really kind of cool and has that kind of feel to it. And I said, you know what guys, let's just try and shoot lightning and see what we can do. So we went out there, and of course, just to continue with the way the night was going, all the lightning went away. So we sat out there under clouds, 
no stars, no lightning. Called it about a half hour later, all right guys, let's go back to the, to the campsite and everybody go to sleep. I'll stay awake and I'll watch and see if stars come out. About one o'clock in the morning, look outside and there's stars. And I quickly wake everybody up and I say, we're back to the Lion King tree, let's go. So we go back there and I look over and I see more clouds moving and I'm like, you've gotta be kidding me. We get all set up and I said, let's be patient, let's see what we get. Sometimes you can get a gap with the stars and the clouds. Well, we got a gap that moved in and you could see the Milky Way shining through it. And then we had lightning off to the left. So I said, all right, everybody, we're gonna expose to the lightning. We'll go ahead and try and pull out the stars using you know, our, 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 our raw data. And we shot and we shot and we shot and we shot and we finally had a huge bolt. And it was so bright that it blew out everybody's frame. Then we reset lowered down our aperture, lowered down our ISO, and we got this shot right here, where we had a beautiful cloud to ground lightning bolt to light up <clears throat> as we light painted the tree, and the stars popped out right here, and we were able to use that uh, data in the raw file to pull up our shadows and blacks and our exposure here to reveal the Milky Way and keep a balanced shot where the highlights weren't blown out in the lightning, but yet we were able to retain enough data to show the Milky Way there. So. A lot of luck happened in this shot. Um, one of my favorite shots that I've taken uh, with, with lightning, actually. And I like to always talk about, at the end here, a uh, funny story. You know, we've talked about being prepared. We've talked about perseverance, patience. Um, we <clears throat> have talked about you know, just everything it takes to go in to create these shots. But we haven't talked about dogs, OK? And that's not what you were expecting me to say. So the reason we're going to talk about dogs is because this shot right here would never have happened without my dog. This is White Sands, New Mexico with the Milky Way, cloud to ground lightning bolts, rays from the setting moon right here coming up and over the clouds, and the glow from one of the towns off to the left lighting up the clouds as well. Out in White Sands decided, hey, uh, let's camp out here. There's some lightning off uh, at sunset, so I decided, hey, I'll shoot some of the lightning, go to bed. Well, my dog, and you guys can ask me after we're done, uh, is a diva. If you want to know more about her, I'll tell you. She will not go to the bathroom anywhere where there's no grass. White sands is her nightmare. <clears throat> So, we did a 10-hour car ride from Dallas out to White Sands, and she would not pee anywhere that we went. So I take her out to White Sands, I'm like, you're going to have a miserable night. Try to get her to use the restroom all night, she wouldn't go. So 2 o'clock in the morning, I'm dead asleep, it's cold, I'm wrapped up in my sleeping bag, nice and warm, and she starts pawing at me and whimpering. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me, you're going to hold it till the morning. Then I thought I'm in a one-person tent with a dog that's about to pee, this is not going to work out for me. <laughs> so I take her outside, <clears throat> I'm like, you better make this quick, it's cold. And she just looks at me like, I don't know what to do. And then off in the distance, I see a flash. And I was like, no way, that's a storm. So I grab my camera out, and I'm like, well, if I'm going to sit here and wait forever for her to do her thing, I'm going to set up my camera and see what happens. So I set up my camera. And I didn't even notice the Milky Way, and I didn't even notice the moon setting. All I saw was a cloud off in the distance, and I thought, hey, might as well shoot. Well, I took a couple shots, and a bolt happened. And I looked at it, and I was really excited. I was like, oh my gosh, I got a cool bolt shot with the stars above. But then I realized I've got the moon bows going, or the moon rays going on, and I've also got the Milky Way shining through. What I didn't realize is I was extremely tired, and when I set my tripod, uh, tripod on the sand, it must have moved, so the whole frame was a little bit out of focus again. So I set it up, <clears throat> saying a few words I won't repeat, because I was just cranky, and took the shot, nothing. Took the shot, nothing happened. Took the shot, and I waited about five, ten minutes or so, and no more bolts. Dog's not going to the bathroom. I'm not getting a shot, so I'm about ready to put her back in the tent. And then the storm starts to grow again. I'm like, okay, maybe now it'll happen. Take a few more shots. Boom. Not one, but two lightning bolts 
come crashing down, and I'm like, all right, this is it. I gotta look at it, make sure it's in focus. I look at it, I see the lightning bolts are in focus, I see the rays from the moon, I see the Milky Way, I'm celebrating, I look over, the dog's peeing, we went to bed. <laughs> Once again, sometimes you get lucky. This shot would never have happened without my dog being a diva. So uh, settings for this shot right here were 800 ISO to 830 seconds. Um, when you're trying to shoot the Milky Way in the night sky, the higher ISO, the lower apertures, longer exposures do help. When you're trying to balance it with something like lava or lightning, you do want to take your settings down and then try to expose for the brightest areas, your highlights, and then use your raw data to pull up your shadows and, and reveal some of that night sky. So that's all I've got for you guys. Um, Real quick, this is my website. If you guys want to go check out some more of my work and about my uh, workshops, this year is completely sold out, but next year has not been announced yet. If you go on the website, they'll be announced at the end of June. Uh, next year is Kauai, Yosemite, Lafontaine, Patagonia, Big Bend, which is a whole Milky Way workshop, Highlands of Iceland, Faroe Islands, and Southern Colorado, Telluride area for fall colors. So I appreciate you guys coming out and taking the time to uh, hear me talk. Thank you.